what is the function of worry? Either you can do something about this problem right now, or you can't. Um, once you recognize that, it becomes easier to just relax back into the mere awareness of what is actually happening right now. Yeah, we both know Peter Atia. He's a obviously big fan of yours. Yeah, yeah, he's a friend. Yeah, and I, I'm sure we know many people in common. I think so. You know, Tim Ferriss, and uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I would just be guessing, but I, I gotta think we got ten friends in common. I think I think that's right. Well, let me ask you because I've always been fascinated with the overlap between Eastern and Western philosophy, and I tend to find that they sort of circle around the same truths, and when one of them find something that works, it seems that the other within a few centuries sort of comes up with the same idea or a sim similar insight in their sort of own way or own metaphors. But meditation is so interesting because there doesn't really seem to be a strong Western counterpart. I guess maybe prayer is one, but but why do you think that is? It, it, it is such a magical thing that works for so many people, but there's not really a super long Western independent tradition of something similar. Yeah, there, there is considerable overlap between uh, you know, some of the Eastern uh, traditions, especially Buddhism, and uh, some pieces of uh, what I would consider the wisest pieces of, of Western philosophy. Uh, but I, th I think a, a major difference is the methodology of meditation and, and just the, the, the systematic approach to studying the mind from, a, from the first person side, from the contemplative side, that really get, got built out in the East in, in a way that it didn't in the West. Uh, I think largely because some of the religious assumptions uh, were different. And um, I mean, you can just, you, you, like in, the, in the Buddhist canon in particular, you can get whole rafts of uh, you know, just meditation guidance, which are almost perfectly designed for export into a secular context because they really they is it really is purely empirical and phenomenological and apart from some you know metaphysical framing and you know some iconography that that sneaks in there i mean they really they're just they're you know whole passages that you could lift out and it would it would be a very modern uh analysis of the nature of consciousness or the nature of uh, you know the, you know, the mechanics of of psychological suffering uh so um and whereas in the West, you know, especially in the, you know, once I'm not speaking so much about uh, Greek and Roman philosophy here, but uh, once uh, Christianity and, and uh, Islam really got rolling, you have this, this Abrahamic, dualistic, propitiatory, prayer-based relationship to the divine, which basically swallows everything. And, and so yeah, there's, there's a difference. But uh, yeah, I would say that within the, in, within the Greek and Roman tradition, Obviously, you know, sto Stoicism is your wheelhouse, and there's really significant overlap between uh, Stoicism and, and Buddhism. And But prior to that, I would say that, that Greek skepticism has a lot of wisdom to share uh, on um, just uh, kind of bracketing our moment-to-moment -moment experience with a, a, um, a non-conceptual, non-clinging, non-judgmental attitude. You know, you just just knowledge is provisional, and yet your being is, you know, the the being, the unity of being, your existence and your your awareness of the moment can't really be doubted. And you just to rest there, you know, contemplatively. Yeah, there's a there's a line. Is it Flaubert or Proust where he says, uh, you know, between uh, Cicero and Marcus Aurelius. Uh, when the gods had ceased to be and the Christ had not yet come, man stood alone in the universe. Now, his timeline's not strictly true. That's not really how it all lines up exactly. But it does strike me there's this, there is a moment there, sort of when the Greeks lead into the Romans, where the old system is falling apart, but the sort of monotheistic Christian God has not, um, not sort of fully come to dominance that there was an opportunity in Western philosophy to chance upon some of the same ideas in Eastern philosophy that we're talking about, the sort of secular, uh, sort of singular, the idea of stillness and emptiness and clarity. It, it's like the, the Stoics and some of the other philosophers, they're dancing around it, but they just, 
they don't seem to ever settle on the idea that you can you can sit there and clear your mind or focus very intently on a singular idea um and 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 that that in and of itself is kind of a spiritual and philosophical pursuit there's some irony in that Marx really his book is called meditations but he's not doing any meditating in the sense that we understand it now right yeah yeah i think it all turns on the the nature of the self or the the illusoriness of the self and just what it is what's there to be discovered if you pay sufficient attention to what it's yeah. like to be what it's like to be you moment to moment and i mean the, the stoics certainly understand that on some level your your mind is all you have and you you're living with your reactivity and and uh the difference between happiness and suffering is is almost entirely a matter of understanding that process and relinquishing your the, your unnecessary suffering which really is is just self-imposed the way you're reacting to to experience and the way you're framing it conceptually the way you're attributing to the world so much power to to move you around emotionally uh and so when you when you um understand something of the mechanics there as, as the stoics do then you you have a degree of freedom that that you otherwise wouldn't and you can you can cease to suffer in all kinds of ordinary and unnecessary ways but the um the the, the real the, the the center of the the jewel of of eastern philosophy and and again buddhism and i would say the, the tradition of advaita vedanta in the indian tradition in particular is that there's this non-dual insight into the illusoriness of the self that the sense of subject object separation is ultimately spurious and that you that on the other side of that there really is a freedom that um can be can be discovered in any in the midst of any experience it's it's really compatible with any waking moment and it doesn't it doesn't actually need anything about the contents of consciousness to change because it really is just the nature of consciousness itself. Um, and that's what's potentially misleading about so many spiritual teachings and spiritual paths. So many of them seem predicated on the belief that you really need to make wholesale changes in the contents of consciousness to make progress, right? You know, like the, the, what it's like to be you right now, the, the ordinary sense of neurotic confinement to, you know, an ordinary mind that wants things and fears things and, and uh regrets the past and worries about the future uh there's something about that that is intrinsically a a form of bondage i mean you're, you're, the evidence of your, your your unenlightenment really is available to you right now and you just need only recognize it recognize it and then this the spiritual path becomes a kind of vigil where you're waiting you know whatever your practice is you're waiting for the 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 auspicious changes to occur in your experience and obviously psychedelics is another approach to this where you you know you haven't had certain insights or experiences and then you take acid or you take mdma or psilocybin and you you seem to break through into a new layer of of mind and you you recognize that there's a landscape of mind that can be traversed uh, but then many people who get into that begin to believe that traversing it really is just a matter of of linking peak experiences together you just got to you have to keep getting high in order to make progress and and have more insights um uh, and i'm not saying there's all of that effort is wasted I, you know I, i've i've drawn a lot of benefit from psychedelics and from various peak experiences i've had in meditation but any peak experience you have uh, you eventually cease to have i mean it's just the very nature of any experience to arise and pass away that's so it's all impermanent and so especially if it is a peak at a certain experience. point it becomes a memory yeah 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 and uh and it, so it can't be a matter of just having more peak experiences ultimately I mean, if you, if your wisdom if the if, the, if the, your deepest wisdom was contained in that peak experience you had last month at joshua tree or uh, at Burning Man, um, well, then by definition, it's just a memory, right? And you're and so the, in, in the present moment, all you all you have is your thoughts about it, and uh, ultimately, that's not good enough. I mean, that's just not that's that's a band aid applied to 
uh, the present moment's experience. What you, what we all need, is an ability to recognize the the intrinsic freedom of awareness in this moment, regardless of what is happening. We have to. We you know, you basically, your, in my view, your your highest spiritual insight, or your highest contemplative wisdom, is whatever you can actually access now in this moment. And if you can't, if you can't find it now, you know, in the middle of uh, the, you know, the bad reaction you just had to your, you know, the thing your spouse said, or the, you know, the email that, that uh, you just received that, that wound you up. It, 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 it's always a matter of, okay, what is available to you now when you remember that you're not this schmuck who is, who's, you know, tied in knots over an email. You're not the, the guy who can't take criticism. You're not, you're, you're not, um, who you were a moment ago when you were captivated by that thought that was making you so unhappy. Now you, the, the spell is broken and you can, you can actually pay attention to something. What is available to your attention? You know, what, what can you be mind to use a, a Buddhist term? What can you be mindful of in this moment? Um, and in the beginning, many people feel that all there is to be mindful of is the evidence of their unenlightenment. They're mindful of anxiety. They're mindful of how restless they are. They're mindful of how distracted they are. But ultimately, once the practice really gets going, what you can be mindful of is the, the fact that there is no subject-object divide in awareness in each moment. And that centerless experience really is uh, freedom. And it's, and it's a freedom that's not predicated on anything about experience changing. So for instance, if you, if, it, if, if you become mindful of that in the midst of a feeling of anger, say, or anxiety, your freedom arrives even before the, the, the physiology of anger and anxiety have dissipated. Because in, the, you know, in that moment, what was anger a moment ago or anxiety a moment ago has no meaning psychologically or philosophically or in any other way so it has no it has no behavioral implications it really is just like you know a feeling of heat on your face you know or or you know a feeling of of fluttering in your chest or it's like it's like it has no more more meaning than a a pain in your knee or indigestion really it's just it's just this peripheral sensory phenomenon and there's no center to the experience of being aware of that and there's no there's really no you in the middle of it and so anyway, we can talk about the the what I mean by the illusoriness of the self if you if you want to. But um, my my basic point is that it really comes down to what is available to attention now. The rest is just something you're thinking about. No, well, actually, Epictetus talks about this. Um, he says, you know, someone's do, working out; they're you know lifting weights. Yeah, you you don't say, "Show me your muscles." you say, show me what you can lift, right? And so, you know, as far as your insights go or your breakthroughs go or your discoveries go or the philosophy you studied goes, that's great. But what matters, and I would agree with what you're saying, what matters is what you can do in the present moment. What matters is what you can do in moments big and small in your, in your actual life. Um, you're not enlightened. Um, if you can't be happy doing the dishes, you know, you're not wise. If you can't see through the noise that's happening around you, if you can't be a, you know, a, a, a good and decent ordinary person in ordinary circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I would add though, that people shouldn't expect that these ordinary contractions uh, into negative states of mind won't keep occurring. Sure. It's just that the, the crucial difference between freedom and, and bondage is how quickly you can wake up from them and what waking and, and, and whether you can really wake up from them. So it's like, it's the half-life of these emotions. So, you know, I'm con I constantly get angry or anxious or impatient, or, I mean, just, you know, I, I there's, there's, there's no, Sure. negative emotion that is fundamentally foreign to me now but the truth is none of these states they, they all they, they they've all begun to function like mindfulness alarms for me right so i'll get it's a very punctate experience it becomes like a, a salience signal where something makes you angry and 
you orient to it in the world. I mean, maybe these emotions are, can, contain information, right? I mean, they, they, there's very often something has just happened that has jumped out of the background of, you know, of, of ambient noise. And it's either worth paying attention to or not. It re either requires a response or not. Um, but anger and anxiety and these other negative emotions are almost never the right state to be in to marshal that response, right? You want, you want a cooler head to, to actually act in the world. And the moment you get out of your thoughts about why you should be angry or what, you know, why you should be anxious and just feel the energy of the emotion and let it dissipate, the half-life of these states is very, very short. I mean, you just can't, you can't stay angry for more than, you know, two, maybe 10 seconds at a time apart from then getting lost in thought again and, and, and dredging the anger up again. It, it, and so it's, um, it really isn't in how quickly you, you recover and, and let it dissipate and that's, and, and, and not have your subsequent thoughts and actions contaminated by that initial reaction. That's, I mean, that's the, that's the major gain I think to hope for I mean, they, because people have this expectation that if they're meditating correctly or if they, they you know they're really wise or spiritual or they have their values in the right place they'll never feel certain emotions again and that's sure. uh, maybe i mean maybe in the limit that's possible for you know a buddha but i i'm not i don't, I don't tend i don't think i've met people who've achieved that and uh, what i have met and what i have met in myself is a is progress in terms of the the half life and just how sure. quickly you wake up from your initial contraction. Yeah, and in meditations, Marx really says, you know, when you're jarred unavoidably by circumstances, what you have to try to do is gather yourself. And he says, come back to the rhythm. And I think about it kind of like in music, if you're ever like playing with a group of musicians, the beat is sort of there. The, the groove of the thing that you're jamming on is there. And you can mess up, you can come off the beat, you can make a mistake, you can get distracted. But the, the song is going on, right? The, the, the other people are continuing to play and you can plug right back into it. You can stop, count to four and get back into it. And so, yeah, whether you want to call it a half-life or a rhythm or, you know, uh, waking up, there's a bunch of ways to express this idea that you, you come off, you, you, you get disoriented, but then you find your bearings and you get back to it. And the quicker you do that, that's the mark of wisdom not the impossible standard of never doing it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And yeah. I actually I mean, found, we, we you know, tend to I... keep score. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I just I would just say that we we tend to keep score in ways that are are um, not helpful. I mean, our the evidence of our unenlightenment is always in the past, right? It's always the thing that happened a moment ago. It's always that thing that happened yesterday. It's actually not f findable in the present if you really pay attention. And so we're, it's like we're, we're, um, we, we're always free to just begin again and not rehearse to ourselves that these kind of litany of you know, psychological crimes we have perpetrated in the past. Uh, because it, it really is, it's, it, it's a very simple choice. You can actually, you can be lost in thought and thinking about the past and telling yourself a story about who you were a moment ago or yesterday, um, or you can actually make contact with your life in the present unencumbered by this, this uh, self-talk. And it's, it's not, I'm not saying you need to block thoughts because uh, thoughts are going to continually arise, but you, you need to recognize them as further appearances in consciousness you know the, 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 there's a very bit the, the, the crucial difference is between being identified with thought not not recognizing this this um these appearances i mean you, it's usually auditory or or visual or some combination of the two where you're I mean, it's very it's very strange that we f that most of us feel most of the time feel identical to our thoughts we feel identical to a voice in our heads. We feel identical to a stream of images. And yet these are just appearances that can be witnessed from a prior condition of, of just being aware of them. Uh, I mean, they're arising in this condition that we call consciousness or awareness. And 
yet uninspected and unrecognized, they feel like us. You know, so you and I are talking right now, and people listening to us or watching us will, are, are are thinking while they're while they're they're trying to they're struggling to to follow the train of this conversation. What they have a voice in their head, most of them certainly, you know, ninety nine percent of them have a voice in their head that is competing for their attention. So they'll be thinking, well, what's he talking about? You know, or like, wait, wait a minute, that's not what I, I, I've read about Buddhism. That's not what, I, and, and who, who are they talking to and who's talking? Yeah. And it, this is an automaticity that is, is claiming their attention moment to moment. But more important, it actually fe it, it feels like I, it feels like me. It feels, it feels like it defines a center, a subject in the midst of experience, in addition to experience. It seems like there's a thinker in addition to the, to the flow of thought. And when you really look, you find that there isn't. And you discover that the self, the, 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 the sense of I in the middle of experience is what it feels like to be lost in thought without knowing it. And uh, so that really, the spell that, that continually has to be broken by meditation is this this continuous habit of being distracted by and, and identified with thought. I want to go back to psychedelics for a second because it connects to something you're talking about, the sort of everydayness of what you do in this present moment. There's something that's bothered me about, and I'm not a psychedelics person, but I don't have a strong opinion about it, I guess, but there's something that's bothered me about calling that the work, right? Calling doing psychedelics the work. when the reality is the work is what we're talking about here. The work is the thing happens, you get cut off in traffic, uh, you're thinking about what other people are thinking about you, you know, um, you're tempted between right and wrong. Like the work, that's the work, right? Having the peak insight in an experience or reading about it in a philosophy book or listening to a podcast. I mean, I guess that's not, not work but it's not the work, right? Like the work is the choices and actions you take in your life. And I guess as someone who cares about the meaning of words, um, that seems like a wrong way to think about it. When you say you're not a psychedelics person, have you taken, have you ever taken any of these compounds or, or not? No, no. Um, I, I guess I've I've found too. Maybe this is uh, more bias for me, but I have yet to hear of an experience from a person doing psychedelics that I have not found in literally every <laughs> philosophy text. You know what I mean? I, I I haven't been that blown away by the in by the insights. I I, I I'm willing to concede there's some there's a difference between being told something and feeling it. So I respect the people coming away with the wowness of what they got. Um, but some of the, um, some of the insights I hear just seem so, so pedestrian or basic to me, um, that I, I, I haven't been compelled to, uh, uh, plunge into that, into that world. Yeah. 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 Well, I, you know, they, the greatest utility for me was in the beginning, and this is, this is admittedly something that not everyone needs, but I, I think I needed it. I mean, so it's hard to know what would have happened without psychedelics in, in sure. my case. But when I, went, when I was 18, I took MDMA for the first time. And the breakthrough for me there was that it, it revealed to me in a, in a very visceral way that my patterns of thinking and the kind of quality of my attention had been radically limiting my experience in life. Like I, I was just, I, and I, it had never occurred to me that it was possible to have a fundamentally different experience emotionally and, and socially and ethically. And like, I, like I hadn't, you know, philo I had, I'm sure I had made some contact with philosophy at that point, you know, at least in, in high school, but, um, it hadn't met, it, 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 it hadn't really landed with me. I mean, I didn't see myself on any kind of path. I didn't, I, 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 it's very hard for me to even recall who I was then, but I was not a budding mystic or, uh, someone who, who even 
was was interested in the nature of his own mind. I don't I, like I was I was an intellectual kid, but I was sure. just I, I I was just uh, it was very anchored to to conceptualizing everything. And I have no idea what I would have thought if you had suggested that I might want to try to meditate to to be happier or to, to discover something about the nature of my mind. And I, I think if I had tried to meditate, I probably would have just bounced off the whole project because I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had a natural aptitude for it. I wouldn't I wouldn't have suddenly gotten very concentrated and, and started to feel something interesting happening. So I would have I would have looked inside and, and felt that there was nothing much to see. And then I just would have gone on thinking that meditation doesn't work and that all of these religious people are, you know, every, every account of spiritual experience or mystical experience in the literature is just a, a symptom of, of temporal lobe epilepsy or, or conscious fraud or say it's just some species of, of delusion. And I think, and there, obviously there are a lot of people who go through life that way. And for these people, the problem is if you, if you give them, you know, if if they're even po available to be, to be given uh, a practice like meditation or a book to read that is, is just chock full of insights or that you, you and I would think is chock full of insights, or you send them to a yoga class or whatever it is, it's quite possible that nothing will happen, right? They, they, they will really will just bounce off. Um, now, the, the unique power of psychedelics, uh, and MDMA technically is not a psychedelic, but but close enough. Um, the, the unique power of, of certain of these, these drugs is that for almost everyone, something is guaranteed to happen, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's a very rare person who can take a, a, a sizable dose of any of these drugs and have nothing happen. Although I guess that occasionally occurs. Um, and now whether, now, now what happens is, uh, a bit of a spin of the roulette wheel, depending on what compound you're talking about. Certainly, with with a proper psychedelic like LSD or psilocybin, you know, you could you could go to heaven or you could go to hell or you could go somewhere in between. But you're going to go somewhere, right? You're going to have sure. a non ordinary experience, and that'll prove to you beyond any possibility of doubt that it is possible to have a very different experience of your of your being in the world. Um, and for you know, some people don't need that. Some people don't, because that's obvious, and they're they're working it out through meditation and philosophy and and in other modes, and they're and they're motivated by that possibility. They they understand that the the mind is a, a landscape that can be explored, uh, but for people who don't, you know, psychedelics can really prove something that it's it would be hard to prove any other way. And so that that was the the, the major utility for me is that it just showed me that. Um, there was much more to my mind and to the possibilities of, of living a fulfilling life than I had realized. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense to me. And I'm perfectly willing to say to each their own, it just strikes me that the work, you know, w what we label what I think is indicative. And to me, the work is not just the, the meditation and I don't know, the therapy and the reading and all of that, but the work is also applying the insights on a day to day basis in the real situations of life um not not the peak experience the peak of experiences are by definition not ordinary uh or consistent yeah yeah and it's it's important to understand that if there really is a way of being radically free in this life you know if there if there is some uh ultimate goal here that can be actualized, it has to be compatible with ordinary waking consciousness. I mean, you, you, it has to be the kind of thing you can notice about yourself and about the, about the nature of your mind while you're walking down the street or driving a car or having a conversation or looking at your email. It, it can't be elsewhere. Right. Right? It's not to say that there aren't very interesting experiences to be had elsewhere when you're, you know, 400 micrograms into an LSD experience, or you're, you've been meditating for, you know, three months in silence and you're, you're, you're as concentrated as you ever, you've ever been. Um, I mean, those are wonderful experiences to have, but whatever can burn off by virtue of your using your attention in a different way, that thing can't be the ultimate thing that, that is your, your refuge. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I, you know, I, I think I share with you this, this sense that it really is in, in our moment to moment living of our lives that our practice is, is real or, or, and our wisdom is real or it isn't. And I, I, I do like that about, you know, meditation, probably unique among all the philosophical practices outside of journaling, which I would probably argue is the sort of Western equivalent of, of, uh, of meditation, but it's, it's a thing that you do, right? It's a, it's a, it, it's something you do. It is a practice, right? It's not a, it, philosophy isn't supposed to be this thing that you read one time and you get. It's supposed to be, to go back to music, it's scales that you run through, or it's, a, you know, it's, it's a thing that you do it's a set of stretches it's exercising um that that to me is what the the great philosophical traditions give us it's a it's a thing to do yeah although ultimately i would say it's a thing you cease to do right so in the mm -hmm. beginning meditation seems like a practice that you're adding to your life it seems like stretching or it seems like exercise where you're you're you weren't doing it and now you're doing it and you're hoping to get some benefit from it and you might even be getting benefit from it you can feel the benefits but ultimately i mean the, the kind of meditation that i'm you know that i teach over at waking up and that that i'm interested in i mean there's there are other types of meditation but sure. you know mindfulness based meditation and ultimately you know non-dual mindfulness is a matter of ceasing to be distracted by thought it's not, it's not a matter of ceasing to think, it's, it's ceasing to be identified with thought and lost in, in the kind of the dreamscape of thought. Um, and so you're actually doing less rather than more. You're not, you're not strategically sure. paying attention to something, although in the be beginning you might be, like you might, the, the first exercise you, you might do is to pay attention to your breath. And then once you have some facility for you know, coming back from being lost in thought and returning to the breath, and you sort of, you know the difference between being lost in thought and actually paying attention to something, then you open it up to everything you're experiencing, sounds and sensations and thoughts and emotions. Um, but ultimately the, 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 um, the change in you is in, it, it, it's almost like a figure ground reversal where you're like the, the thing that w was, um, seemed to be an artifice in the beginning is just, is actually uh, the ground of where, where you always already are. And you're, you're sort of waking up and returning to, to what is already the case. And so you're not, it's, it's not additive. Whereas there are practices that can seem just by their very nature additive. Like, you know, if you're doing a, a mantra based practice, you know, you're, 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 you're rehearsing a, a sans, Sanskrit phrase in your head and you're adding that, and then you could wonder, well, why am I adding that to my experience? And what does it mean? And you know, are there, is this, is there something magical about Sanskrit? Why couldn't this be in some other language? Uh, and so that there's a, a, a basis for doubt there. Um, ultimately with mindfulness, you're not doing anything other than noticing what is happening all by itself. I mean, everything, everything's arising all by itself, thoughts, sensations, uh, you know, it's just, there's no, no, there's nothing that you, the witness, are bringing into being, and it's in that recognition that you see that there's uh, that the problem uh, that you thought you needed to solve a moment ago isn't even there, right? The problem of your anxiety, the problem of your of your disappointment, the problem of your uh, you know, it, it, it's always this thought based delusion that something that's not actually present here is it needs to be unraveled you know i'm not saying that there aren't challenging experiences i mean there's obviously the things like physical pain and and uh you know that doesn't magically go away once you know how to meditate but so much of our suffering in response to something like physical pain is our psychological contraction around it and our anxiety about it and our you know fear that it won't go away and our fear of what it means and oh, do i need to get an mri and this, you know, is this, is this cancer? And like, like all of that, again, there's not, you can figure all that out. I mean, I'm not saying you never need to go to a doctor and never need to get an MRI and that you're never going to get cancer, but the, each stage along the way, 
there's always the question of what is worth paying attention to now. And I mean, this is where the, the Stoics have this very much in hand. I mean, this, this ho whole issue of what is the function of worry, right? I mean, either you can, ch either you can do something about this problem right now, or you can't, if you can do something about the problem, well then do that thing. Uh, and if you can't worry, doesn't add anything to your capacity to do anything. It just, it just makes you miserable twice over. And so, um, yeah, once you recognize that, it's it becomes easier to just relax back into the mere awareness of what is what is actually happening right now. Yeah, for the Stoics, it's um, it's not things that upset us; it's our opinion about things, and the ability to sort of catch when you're having an opinion is a real superpower. And to me, that that is you know what meditation is: the ability to realize when you're, or mindfulness is the ability to realize when you're having thoughts and opinions and engaging in extrapolation and speculation and judgment, as opposed to just being in whatever that thing is, which, as you said, it could be pain. You could be in pain, but what we add on top of that, I think the Stoics say is, and I'm going to die from it, and I am a victim, you know, the on and on and on, we, we're, we're adding all this language around it instead of simply dealing with the first impression or the reality of it. So I'm curious about, about the, the app because uh, it's something I, I think about too. I mean, it's great. I know so many people that rave about it. Um, it's weird to take this timeless ancient thing and make it a, th a thing that people can use and purchase. I think about that. that it's not that it's, um, I feel ethically challenged about it, but I do try to think about what my, I think of myself as this steward of this thing that's been beneficial to me and I put time and energy and work in it. And that's why I feel comfortable, you know, selling it as a thing. But I, I really liked your idea that you charge for it and then you you give it away for free to anyone who basically um, can't afford to pay for it. I, I've, I've always found that really impressive about you. Yeah, that's been my approach with all my digital media. So like, so my, my podcast is also a subscription podcast. I don't, I don't run ads on it. I just think I, there's really two priorities for me here. I mean, one is just from the from the media business side, I feel that we have suffered a race to the bottom in how we value digital media. I mean, the, the, the ad based business model of, of the internet, I think really screwed us and, you know, it, never more so than, than on social media with things like Facebook, but you know, really across the board, it has, it has given everyone the sense that digital content should be free, right? You know, it's like, you shouldn't have to pay for anything that's digital. Um, because the expectation is it all should be ad supported. And, you know, as, as I'm sure you've talked about elsewhere, this has created a, a really perverse set of incentives in our, in our, um, economy, you know, where we just, you know, people are, are being manipulated. Their attention is being, uh, is, is being gamed in ways that are beneficial to companies and, but not beneficial to the, to the person. Um, and it becomes, you know, we, we have built these various outrage machines that spread divisive and f largely false content and, you know, sure. and it's given, uh, an immense, immense agency to liars and lunatics and, uh, has made it, uh, very hard to, to make sense at scale. And, and we're, we're, you know, various people are working to unravel that in various ways. Uh, and that's something I've talked about a fair amount on my podcast. Uh, but so I've always felt that the the better model is a subscription model that on some level you get what you pay for. And, you know, it's it's not an accident that, you know, Facebook and Twitter and these other platforms have you know, fairly shattered society. And yet a, a service like Netflix can just, you know, show you good movies and good television and you, you, pay, you pay for it and it's fine. Um, so I would I would like a lot more of Netflix and a lot less of of the Facebook Twitter experience in in general, um, but 
in addition, I feel like I mean, given the nature of the content, given that that these practices and, and this kind of uh, thinking is so life changing for people, I, f I have always felt an ethical responsibility to make it available to anyone who who needs it, you know, so that that money is never the reason why someone can't get access to it. So um, really, I'm doing I, I'm doing something that from a business point of view seems a little paradoxical. I mean, the, the you know, waking up is is more expensive than other meditation apps. And I think it's, I think it's probably, you know, I think the price will probably go up in the future because I, I think we, again, the whole category has been unnat unnaturally anchored to, to, to free, you know, in the end. Uh, and I do want to build a very successful business that can do lots of cool things out in the world. And uh, I want people to be paid well. And I've got, you know, I give people, you know, health insurance and dental insurance and you know, the, it's a company that's growing and all of that. But, um, I never want, so I never want money to be the reason why someone can't get access to it. So, and people just have to send us an email and they get, they get free access. And, um, you know, there were days, you know, during COVID where a thousand people a day would send that email, you know, and we would, you know, I've, I've got uh, a, a major customer service team, you know, 95% of their, their effort is just dealing with free accounts. Right. So it's, sure. And it just, it, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. It's a straight, it's a strange thing. Cause I can't quite recommend this business model to other people. Like I, th I do think that for instance, if Netflix had my policy, I think Netflix would be destroyed. I think if Netflix sure. said, listen, we never want anyone, we'd never want money to be the reason why you can't watch our great shows and movies. So just send us an email if you want it for free. You know, I think probably a hundred million people would send that email uh, because right. they would rather have Netflix, Netflix for free. And we, there would be no Netflix. And so it's, it's a very, I feel, you know, frankly, I'm in, in an uncomfortable situation because I don't know what to recommend to other people. I really feel like this is a, it's a wonderfully ethical way to have a digital business and I feel great about it, but I, 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 I have, I just feel very lucky that it's working for us because it, it's very easy to envision a world where it wouldn't work. And I, I think it wouldn't work for certain other businesses. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? And I think this is a, a thing that a lot of entrepreneurs and business people and artists sort of fail to sit down and do is like, if you have some sense of what you're trying to accomplish and your, your aim is not to take over the world or build a billion dollar behemoth or something, you're able to make these sort of ethical decisions because you haven't tied yourself to some sort of rocket ship or you haven't taken lots of money from other people who, you know, aren't willing to trade profits for impact. Um, and so I, I, I think I like this sort of smaller business model of I'm trying to make something cool. My time is worth money, so I'm not giving it away to free for free for people who can easily afford to pay. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to have the people who can pay subsidize some of the people who can't pay, but you know, I'm not trying to build, um, the next Facebook or Twitter because those are, those are wicked, uh, economics and incentives to tie oneself to. And once you do, it's very hard to scale it back. Yeah. 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 No, it's, uh, I mean, it's the wild west out there, as you know, in digital media and everyone's just trying to figure it out, but I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be out of the ad world and I'm, uh, I'm just very happy to have a relationship with with my audience that allows for this this kind of trust, right? And and I, I do feel like the people who pay for my podcast and for and for waking up in general are happy to know that people who can't pay are getting subsidized by by the you know their subscriptions. I mean, it's just it's not a yeah. I don't think people feel foolish to pay when it's possible not to pay. I think people understand. The, the spirit of, of this. And, um, yeah, it just, it just, it just feels very good. And, you know, I, obviously I recognize that, that it's only digital media that really allows for this, you know, you couldn't do this with physical books or, or, you know, so something that, that didn't have a, a essentially a, a zero, um, marginal cost per, per item. But yeah, so it's, it's fun. It's, it's, a, it's a fun side of it. I mean, I would have loved, I, when I wrote, I wrote my first book about sort of media and incentives in media, like in 2000, I was writing in 2011, it came out in 2012. I thought sort of subscriptions 
would be this kind of magical change in incentives that would make everything better. Um, I think it's improved things in a lot of ways. I think it's, you know, on the whole better than the sort of uh, clickbait sort of page view model. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about is I think it's a good example of this is, and I like Barry Weiss a, a lot. I know her. You're sort of the last man standing of the intellectual dark web that did not either turn into a complete grifter or utterly lose their mind. And I think a lot of that is about audience capture and a different kind of incentives. I mean, some of it's algorithmic, but it does seem it does seem that something went sideways there, or maybe the critics were right all along and they saw through a group of these people. But that's been a strange journey to watch over the last couple of years. Sad one, really. Yeah. Yeah, no, it has been. Um... I think audience capture is part of it. I mean, I, I, I have it now we're talking about the podcast side of my life, not, not waking up because yes. waking up is, is blissfully unencumbered by all of these political, um, sure. controversies. And it's, it's really, it's, it's just as a, from the side of producing, uh, this, this content, it's really been interesting to, to row in two boats in this way, because, you know, in the waking up boat, it, 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 so superficially, my podcast and, and the app waking up should, uh, should be very similar experiences. I mean, I'm, I'm just pushing out MP3 files to the universe, sure. right? I mean, it's just me producing audio, me having conversations, me following my interests as, as they arise. Uh, but because over at waking up, I'm focused on, you know, the most important things I've ever learned that, that are really focused on how to live a, a, an examined and, and fulfilling life. What I get back is just pure positivity. And it's just, it's, it's just, you know, I, and, and it was really eye opening for me because I can't, I, the, I started the podcast first and the podcast is where I touch all these controversial culture war issues. And I, mean, I, I spent a lot of time on, you know, thinking about interesting things that are not political too, but I certainly don't shy away from politics and and the feedback there has been always a mix of you know love and hate and and so, so I lost I just I lost sight of the fact that it was actually possible to have a career and have an engage, a mode of engaging with the world where what you get back is virtually 100% positive right and so it was pretty eye opening for me to to start waking up and just see well this is other channel here where there's no mismatch between what I'm intending to put out and what people are receiving. People aren't lying about what I said, or you know, they're not pretending to to misunderstand me. It's just it's just a love fest. Um, and then over here in my in my podcast life, it is just a war. You know, at least half the time. Um, so that difference has been interesting. But yeah, as far as what's happened to the so-called IDW bunch. Um, audience capture is a real thing, and it, and I've avoided it because, again, it was it was the one thing that I felt w was p possibly corrupting of my of my um, podcast because I, I I don't have sponsors, so there's no concern about being dropped by them, right? So I I, I bypass that concern, but. Uh, it, it it would be possible even in a, with a, sub, a subscription business to detect the signal in the noise of, of feedback and recognize okay this is what my audience wants from me and they're going to pay me more if I keep de de delivering this kind of pablum. Um, but very early on, because of my because I'm not actually partisan politically, I'm not actually tribal. I really do just call balls and strikes as I see them. And I, I try to be intellectually honest across the board. And I, I try to be intellectually honest, even in the, even when someone who I really feel is worthy of criticism is being criticized unfairly. I mean, it'll take somebody like Trump. I mean, there's no, you know, I, I've been as critical of, of Trump as, as I think anyone on earth at this point. But when I see one of his detractors say something that's actually not true, you know, but landing a bl landing a false blow on him, I I resist that, right? Like I'm not happy to to pile on the wrong, you know, 
sure. the wrong form of criticism. And so, so, so I, I wind up, if that's given that that's my algorithm, essentially being, being honest in a non-tribal, non-partisan way, um, I, I managed to piss off people on all sides of the political spectrum. And it like, there's, there's almost no one in my audience who hasn't had the experience of, of being disappointed by me based on me taking a position that didn't line up with the last five things they, they thought they, you know, sure. that they agreed with me on. And, um, so I, so I have an audience that I have, you know, I really have to earn their respect every single time. You know, I'm really on some level, I'm only as good as the, my last sentence with my audience. It's not a, tr it's not a tribal echo chamber because, because I just haven't, I haven't played. I, again, I haven't, um, I've, t I've touched such a diversity of topics and I haven't, I haven't, uh, become partisan. And so it's, it's a, so yeah, I mean, that's the one thing I did guard against this, this fe this feeling of audience capture where you're pandering to an, to an audience because that has become a flywheel for you. But I do see people, especially, um, when they're, I mean, subscription is a little different from, from ad revenue in that you're not um, you're not narrowly hostage to the normal viral dynamics, you know, like you're not, you're not concerned so much about audience size and clicks and virality in the same way you're, you're concerned about, you know, you're just, you're from a business sense, you're in a business sense, you're concerned about your subscribers. So I, I do notice the worst audience capture with people who are, who are, um, monetized by ads, but I guess it's possible in every context. And it's really, it's the, I think it's the one thing that really has to be avoided. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> Paul Graham's thing about keeping your identity small, that strikes me as a big contributing factor, sort of people starting to identify with one group or identifying as being even a contrarian is, seems to be sort of an intellectual death sentence. I wonder how much of that group was thrown together by sort of odd survivorship bias circumstances like they were sort of already disposed to be this that or the other and then i wonder how much of it is just the corruption of fame and attention which is not not good for the soul and social media you know being extremely online as they call it also being bad for the soul Well, t Twitter was definitely part of it. I mean, I, uh, you know, as you may or may not know, I deleted my Twitter account uh, I like that. about a month ago. And, it's, and I had been on, I've been very active on it for 12 years or so. And, in, you know, on, on one level, it was a, a total failure of stoicism on, on my part in that I got so uh, entangled with it. Uh, but I, you know, the, it was the, it's the only social media platform that I ever used. I mean, we've, I've, we've got a, I've got a presence on the others just, you know, from sure. a, a marketing point of view, but I, I never look at Facebook or, or Instagram. Um, it was, so Twitter was the only one I really used and I, I really did want to use it to communicate. And I was, you know, I was following a lot of smart people and I was, you know, enjoying what, you know, the, the articles they were, they were forwarding. And, and so it was valuable to me at the time, but it, it started, I, I got the sense that I was just seeing, it became this funhouse mirror in which I was seeing the worst of humanity. And I was, I feel like I was seeing uh, a, a, a distorted picture of even people who, who, you know, were acting badly and were, you know, disposed to act badly toward me. But it's like, I just, there, there couldn't be that many psychopaths in the world, right? And I, and I was having an experience on Twitter where I felt like I was meeting thousands of psychopaths every day. Like, like, it's like I, I built a machine that allowed psychopaths to just show up in my living room. Um, so at a certain point, I mean, you know, there's, there are two choices there. One, I could be stoical about it. I could just say, all right, you, you know, I could follow Marcus Aurelius and, and say, okay, you're going to be, you know, when I get out of bed today, I know I'm going to meet lots of, you know, psychopathic assholes and, and I can just price that in and, sure. and, uh, have a thick skin and not react. Um, but I, but, and I did that, you know, for, for, for significant stretches of time, I would do that, but there was some reason I, I kept coming back. I, I mean, it was, it kept becoming a, a focus of my attention to be just engaging or not engaging or noticing or not noticing. 
And at a certain point, I just felt like the, actually the, the better part of wisdom here is just to, just to really rip this bandaid off and not, uh, and not do this anymore. You know? Uh, so I, you know, I, 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 I know people, I know there are some people who have very different experiences on Twitter. They just, just, you know, they're, they're sending, they're sharing happy cat videos and just getting love in response. But, um, you know, for me, deleting my account has just been uh, an enormously positive change in my life. I mean, it's like I just got out of a bad relationship and it's, it's, uh, now I look back fairly aghast that I spent that amount of time even knowing what was happening on Twitter. I mean, it's just, it's, I have a very different sense of my, of just where I exist in the world now. It's just, it's a very, it was, you know, it's very hard to describe, but I, it, like when you when you're very active on Twitter and you f and you are noticing what is happening to your reputation there or to your relationships there, or your, it's um. It seems real in a way in which in which it really isn't quite real. You know, certainly in my world, it's it's not real. I mean, I, I would have experiences on Twitter where, you know, for for half for half of Twitter, you know, I had just destroyed my career. Right. Just like it's just a five alarm fire. And yet actually in my life, in every sense that matters, including, you know, my actual you know career and my actual business, nothing had happened, you know. Right. So it's like it really is just a it's a hallucination. And yet it's it's a, it's a hallucination that's always available to draw you in. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a it's a weird thing. It's like, are you using the service or is the service using you? And, you know, if, if the essence of the sort of Eastern philosophy and the essence, I think of the Western philosophy is to get free, right. To free yourself from these things. Um, realizing when something has an inordinate or an unhealthy amount of power over you and to be able to make that break, I think that's a really good muscle to flex, even if it's over something, you know, more benign than, than social media. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's deciding just to no longer do something that is, you know, in your coolest moment, you can recognize, all right, this is a net negative for my yeah. life. Why do I keep doing this thing? And to just to decisively actually break up with that thing. That's, it's a, it, it, that's an all too rare experience. And it's, it's, uh, it's very positive when it happens. Um, so, yeah, well, Mark, Marcus it. Aurelius's quote, it's a good one. You're right. He opens meditations with a, here's what I'm going to experience today, this, this, and this, and this. But I guess the question is, to intersect with another Stoic teaching is, is doing that, going into that place, meeting those people, is it in your control or not? So if, you know, you're the emperor, the reality is you're going to have to do a bunch of these things. That's not fully in your control. And so you should brace yourself. But if there's always traffic on this side of town, but over here, there's a clearer road. You'd be a fool to drive through the traffic jam if it's not necessary. And so I guess it's a tension of like, when does one simply endure and put up with something? And when does one have some agency or ability to say, hey, I'm not going to subject myself to that? Yeah, no, it's it's very simplifying. It's a, um, well, actually, there's a, a connection to mindfulness here because I, you know, my you know, mindfulness for me is just one tool. It's not the, it's not the sure. only thing you need to live a, a truly fulfilling life. Um, and uh, another tool which, which the, the Stoics really have in hand is what is now generally referred to as reframing in, in uh, psychological science and in, in cognitive science where you, you just think differently about the situation. So if, you know, to take, um, one example, I mean, let's say you're, you're afraid of public speaking, right? Every time you get out on stage, you've got this, this sunburst of anxiety that you, is, is difficult to deal with. Um, and so there are different ways to approach this. What you, with mindfulness, you could just be mindful of anxiety, right? And just become, just achieve equanimity with the feeling of anxiety that keeps coming down every time you you um, even think about the fact that you have to give a public talk, say, 
Um, but reframing is a, is a higher level approach to solving the problem, which is actually just thinking about it differently. Um, and there are you know various levels at which you could do that, but uh, one level is just is just to well you know the the ultimate level is to have enough experience doing the thing in this case public speaking where you and have enough a positive experience with it where you begin to feel differently about it like you sure. just now associate confidence. different things with it and 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 many people have you know, and you have a different feeling of your own competence and many people grow in that direction. Um, uh, Reframing would be something in the middle of, of just like noticing anxiety, but then noticing that uh, actually the feeling of anxiety itself is is very similar to the feeling of excitement, and it's really just the cognitive story around those th hmm. that that you know uh, sensory thrill or that um, you know sympathetic uh, uh, adrenalized thrill that is making the difference between positive and negative. You know, you pay, you would pay money to be excited in this way. And yet you're dreading feeling anxious in this way. Sure. And yet it's really just at the level of your, of the conceptual frame that they're differentiated. Um, and to notice that is allows you to, to, um, to think differently about it. And that's, that's sort of that higher level approach, whether it's the level of reframing or at the ultimate level of actually just having different associations with, with this experience. Um, that is some, that's somewhat analogous to just taking this other road. You know, it's like, okay, you can be mindful of all the traffic. You can be mindful of anxiety, or you can just figure out there's an, there's another way to, there's another part of the city where you, you could be driving and, and, you know, why not do that? And so there's, I, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of wisdom in, in finding those, those um, kind of higher level, more comprehensive changes to make. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, that's not incompatible. With mindfulness but it's it's a, it's a different mode no i think i think that's beautifully said and, and probably a good place to wrap up uh, i i will say i i have found the way that you have navigated those choppy waters and not being dragged in a certain direction i would say largely not being dragged down into what seems like a very dark and effed up place for a lot of these dudes uh i, I found it to be very impressive and uh and uh, it's made me like your work even more. So uh, good on you. Oh, nice. Well, it's great to talk to you. Nice to meet you virtually. I hope yeah. we do it one day in person. Yeah, let's let's do it. So yeah, I just wa I wanted to congratulate you on uh, being one of a handful of people who have brought stoicism back into such prominence. I mean, it was it was really your work and uh, Bill Irvin's, and uh, I mean, it's really just the two of you. I mean, I'm sure other people have have been putting their shoulder to the wheel, but like, you know, you have been the most prominent person to my eye. And it's, uh, it's really fantastic to see ancient wisdom suddenly being, uh, of, of interest to a new generation of people. And, and it's, it's, it's really the best of philosophy because, you know, for hundreds of years, as you probably know, philosophy got fairly divorced from the question of just how to live a good life. And there was no implication to hear, to hear that someone was a philosopher uh, bore absolutely no, uh, implication that that person would be wise or happy or well integrated or compassionate or anything, right? It's just, um, I mean, basically all you knew is that that person was smart or thought they were smart, uh, to be a philosopher. And, um, to, so to see you bringing back this, um, uh, this focus on you know the utility of philosophy for helping people live good lives. I mean that's it's really I, it's been a fantastic contribution, and and I, I know a lot of people have benefited. So, congratulations on on finding a way to do that with it. You know could could occupy uh, your life and and uh, and grow your career and and all of it. I mean it's just it's it's fantastic to see from the outside. Well, that, that means a lot to me because I uh, you opened my eyes. I was probably your ordinary, that's probably a cliche at this point, but your sort of college kid that read your stuff and Dawkins stuff. And it, it sort of opened my mind from a, from a sort of a religious standpoint, which was beautiful and important. And then I think stoicism, when, when people um, point out that, you know, me and Bill and Professor Nancy Sherman and Massimo Pigliucci, a bunch of these people have sort of popularized stoicism. I sort of point to your work and then also just sort of 
the, the sort of Buddhist and Confucian thought. And I go, Stoicism is a tiny, like the awareness of Stoicism in the modern world is a tiny fraction of what some of these other ideas have, have managed to reach. So I, I get excited also about just how many people there are left in the world that have no idea that there has been these tools, East and West, um, that uh, tools, insights, you know, strategies, whatever you want to call them, that that help. Um, and then people have no idea they exist because they think philosophy is, you know, theoretical questions about how do we know whether we're living in a computer simulation or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, so uh, keep going. Don't stop. I will. I will. Thank you very much.